You're listening to the Soul Strategies podcast hosted by the team here at Soul Strategies. We hope you like the latest episode and thanks for tuning in. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Soul Strategies podcast. I'm your host, James Ray at James Gets Political on TikTok. And today we're going to be discussing environmentalism and the differences between eco-socialism and green capitalism with Josh Willis. He's an eco-socialist political advocate and the Twitter director of the progressive organization Done Waiting. So, Josh, let's get started. My first question, I suppose, is what is eco-socialism and what is green capitalism? Well, I want to start by saying it's great to be back. I'm super excited about this. Uh, I think <laughs> when talking about uh, green capitalism versus eco-socialism, I think that uh, uh, a lot of what we see uh, in, t- in today's day and age, uh, when we look around and see a lot of uh, environmentalism, especially environmentalism that we see from corporations, uh, is, is pretty much what we like to call green capitalism. Now, there are people who do subscribe to green capitalism. Um, more often than not, they'll call themselves eco-capitalists, but it, in the leftist sphere, we like to call them green capitalists kind of as a derogatory way, um, because we do believe as eco-socialists, as I will get into later, that uh, you really can't address uh, a problem uh, by continuing to do what caused the problem in the first place. So green capitalism, basically, from my understanding and from the understanding of like a leftist perspective, is basically the idea that the market will force capital to eventually address a changing climate um, because with the climate changing in the way it is, it's going to eventually hinder profit margins. Um, so the capitalist kind of view on that is that the free market is going to have to dictate that changes will have to be implemented through uh, businesses regulating themselves better because it doesn't really help the profit margin of a business that isn't regulating themselves. If uh, they destroy the environment, they destroy the resources, they don't have the resources to eventually you know, sell more, make more money if they run out. Um, the eco-socialist kind of belief is the swing on that, that that is all a load of garbage. <laughs> like I said, uh, as an eco-socialist and many eco-socialists will agree with me, the solution to a problem is never the thing that caused the problem. Um, eco-socialists basically believe that the root of most of the problems that we see in our society um, in general, uh, obviously including environmentalism, but moving beyond that even, is that capitalism has kind of driven those problems, right? So eco-socialists obviously do believe that environmental problems have been caused majorly by the capitalist economic system. Um, however, we don't stop there. We like to really go into saying that, you know, war, uh, imperialism, poverty, right? Those are things that were caused by capitalism and the necessity of, of resources, the necessity of money, right? It all comes down to profit. It all comes down to... Uh, how how best to make money and exploit your your surroundings to make a profit, right? Uh, and, and surroundings in the eco-socialist belief, meaning not only your surroundings as in your physical, natural surrounding, your natural resources, but also the people who live there, right? The people who are, you are exploiting to make that profit. So that's kind of the difference between eco-socialism and green capitalism, at least in my understanding, it's kind of a very basic overview. But uh, that, that's kind of the way I like to define it to people when they ask. Hey, you're listening to the Soul Strategies Podcast. Take a moment to listen to some of our esteemed champions and their takeaways from the program. Thank you, Z and Michael and everybody else in Soul Strategies for, one, reaching out and making sure that we are all part of something bigger and giving us the resources that we may not have even looked for. Head over to soulstrategies.com now to find out more information. No, I mean, that, then that makes total sense to me. I mean, and I, I guess it's just a divergence of a solution to a similar problem uh, in, in a way. I, I mean, I, I guess the framing is obviously very different from a leftist socialist perspective versus someone fundamentally rooted in more of a capitalist ideology. And the idea that, like, what, rather than uh, rather than corporations being self-regulating to a degree in which they will mitigate damage as it starts to affect their profit margins, that eco-socialism proposes that the entire idea of the exploitation laden of both the laden in both environmental exploitation and labor exploitation that is a functional component of capitalism 
leads to a, a situation in which corporations may never actually be incentivized to prioritize environmental health over their profit margins, even if that means the outright destruction of the environment as they see it and the outright destruction of long-term profitability or long-term um, stability, even really, I guess, in the environmental context. And I, I find that interesting. And I think there are there is pretty ample evidence of that across the, the globe, uh, particularly when we start looking at like exploitation of resources and the destruction of environments uh, in the global south as a result of, um, of corporate actions. Specifically, I'm thinking rainforests uh, and water reserves are the two that I really, really come to mind when I'm thinking of self-destructive behavior that isn't really mitigated until an outside force can begin imposing even the bare semblance of regulatory process. Um, but nonetheless, I find it to be a very interesting thing. Building off of that then, what really made you be inclined to, to call yourself or to begin delving into eco-socialist rhetoric? And, and really, what are your critiques with green capitalism beyond its seeming inability to properly address the problem and, or where the problems are stemming from? Well, um, the first thing that I really got into in politics was environmentalism. Uh, where I live is a very, uh, we are an uh, eco-tourist market. People like to come to where I live to experience the mountains, to experience the lakes, to experience you know, the natural environment around them. Um, so I think inherently that has kind of created at least in my community, uh, the young people look around and they're like, okay, well, we got to protect this. Like, this is gorgeous. We love living here. Um, and we see every day uh, people who are in positions of power, elected representatives of our area who work against the very thing that keeps our area profitable in the way, meaning like what keeps our like food on our family's tables, right? Um, so that was kind of my first introduction to that was just looking around at the natural beauty of my area and being like, I want to keep this as beautiful as possible. Like I want my kids, my grandkids, my great grandkids to be able to experience the natural beauty that is around them. Um, truly like a love for nature is kind of what brings about, uh, you know, that environmentalist kind of uh, drive for a lot of people. Right. And that was definitely the case for me. Um, I know specifically the moment where I had always had these kind of feelings, but specifically for me, it came down to, uh, I was in high school um, and I uh, created a young green club um, in my high school, basically a bunch of environmental, uh, environmentally minded kids that all like me thought that not enough was being done. We were watching, um, we were watching the planet you know, kind of succumb to hundreds of years of, Amer of, of uh, you know, America and the West in general, absolutely brutalizing it, right? We were watching the environment change around us and we were saying, okay, well, uh, at this point, there's not many generations left that can kind of just roll over and let this happen. Like we have to do something about it and we're not. We're pretending to address the problem, but we need to actually work to address the problem. And so it was because of that belief that we started this program um, with the Green Party uh, of our county, who was very active. Obviously, like I said, the uh, the environment, ecotourism, very popular here. So the Green Party is is pretty active in my area of New York. Um, so we did some work with them. We helped with them with uh, congressional campaigns. Uh, raised money and tried to, and we sent, you know, supplies to Standing Rock protesters. Um, we were very, very driven in the fact that we wanted to kind of create this space that where a bunch of environmentally minded kids could come and meet after school and talk about how we can actually address problems, the problems that we were seeing not being addressed uh, correctly in our opinion in the news, right? And I think that that was kind of my introduction to that. And I think that now, I mean, all you have to do is, 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 turn on the TV or even, you know, look around you. And I don't know how you couldn't be an environmentalist in today's day and age. I mean, like, let's just think about what's happened in the last month, right? It's the middle of July. Uh, the entire American West is on fire. Um, I live in the East Coast. And the fact that this is now the second straight summer, I'm a very big, like, I love astrophotography. I love taking pictures of like the mountains and stuff. I haven't been able to do that this year. 
because for the second straight summer, while the West is on fire 3,000 miles away, I am now at a position where I walk outside and I look up and what you think is clouds is actually just smoke from burning wildfires 3,000 miles away. You know, the sun is, is, is beat red. Um, when it's kind of shining through all of the all of the dense smoke that is up there, right? Uh, you, it's crazy things like you see in the weather that it's supposed to be sunny out, but you look up and you don't see the sun, or you see the sun and it's very like tinted, and it's oh that's no those aren't clouds, you know that that's just that's smoke. Um, we're seeing things like the water levels are rising, right? Uh, we're I know personally living in uh, you know what I would consider to be New England or at least close to New England, the fact that a tropical storm a few weeks ago just ran through New England and the first week of July is absolutely incredible because every time we've ever had tropical storms in my lifetime, um, they kind of hit like in mid to late September if they're gonna get up this far. Um, the idea that you know we are not even really into hurricane season and tropical storms are already making their way all the way up to New England is kind of uh, scary because you literally are looking around and you're noticing the, the change in climate. I like to say this all the time that Climate change is not coming. Climate change is here. Like, look outside. See, see what happened in Texas. See what happened in California. See, just look around you and see that we really have failed to address the climate, and we are at a position where our our backs are against the wall, and we need to do a lot more than what we have been doing. Um, and I think that, like I said, the eco socialist tint on that, in my opinion, is the only way for us to solve the problems is to completely redo and overhaul how we are addressing this because addressing this in a way that is allowing the continued pollution of our planet, the continued destruction of our natural resources, the continued exploitation of, of marginalized groups, it's clearly not working. And regulation of these exploitations and these uh, destructions of our natural resources is clearly not working. We're at the point now where you can look up and you can see in the sky that it's not working. We have run out of time to slap on a few restrictions and a few regulations and say, well, I mean, now we just kind of sit and wait and see if it works. You know, that time is up. We lost that chance. Uh, the chance to, to do small, small regulatory measures is long gone. Um, we need sweeping, sweeping change and a sweeping change in our approach to how we address these issues. And I think that's inherently what uh, eco-socialists believe is that we need to address the climate crisis in an entirely new direction than we have been because we can't just keep doing, you know, like they say, uh, insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. And that's basically what green capitalism is to me. It's the idea that we can keep on slapping these restrictions and these regulations that are not even mandatory onto these companies and expecting that they're going to decide, oh, well, it hurts our profit margin. Um, so we're just going to, you know, stop, uh, stop polluting as much. We've already seen that that's not working and we're watching the planet fall apart around us. Uh, we are at a, a point in time where we need to completely overhaul and completely readdress what we have, uh, the way that we've been approaching these, because we are at a position where, you know, our backs against the wall, time's running out. Given that observation, what what do you think about the Green New Deal uh, as far as a potential beginnings of a solution to the problem? So there are two versions of the Green New Deal. Uh, obviously, there is the Green New Deal, the eco-socialist Green New Deal that was championed by Howie Hawkins and the Green Party. Um, and then there's the Green New Deal that has been bouncing around uh, that has been bouncing around, uh, you know, Congress for a couple of years. Um, I don't think any uh, environmental activist will tell you that they think the Green New Deal is a bad thing. Um, I think it's incredibly important for us to mix our labor and our environmentalism together. I think that a complete restructuring of how we do things um, in a way that is more environmentally focused is what is needed. Um, I don't think it goes far enough, and I think that is a great, it is a great foot in the door. You know what I mean? It is a great, uh, let, like, let's start, you know, let's start moving that way. Um, I think that ultimately, you know, um, the organization that I worked for champions the Green New Deal. I am a very big fan of any politician that wants to come on board and say that we need the Green New Deal because the Green New Deal is, is absolutely something that we need to at least start thinking about moving towards <laughs> because if we don't, we're going to be in a position 
where we're still stuck uh, sitting around, our, 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 our labor market is not transitioning to a more environmental, sustainable, you know, kind of uh, space. Uh, and we're going to end up a lot like we are now. We're in a holding pattern where any change is good change, in my opinion. And the Green New Deal offers that change. The Green New Deal offers a, a more a, 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 a path towards environmentalism, a path towards sustainable uh, resources, a path towards uh, retraining the labor market to be more sustainable, more green, better energy. Uh, in a lot of ways, it is pretty much, I think, I think it is, like I said, great first step. I would not back any uh, politician that doesn't support the Green New Deal because I think it is, is bare minimum. It is what we need. It's the direction we need to move in if we have any shot, any shot at reducing or at least uh, slowing down the effects of climate change. So you had said that it's somewhat of a bare minimum, and I, I agree, and I've actually, I've heard from several eco-socialist colleagues that I know, uh, particularly those in Florida, who are working uh, to combat highway construction in the Everglades, which has for some reason become a very um, interesting issue in Florida over the last few months. They, they've all kind of noted that the Green New Deal, though very, very good legislation generally, doesn't go far enough or is at best kind of the beginning stepping stone to a better program. Now, that coupled with an understanding that eco-socialists generally kind of advise, like when they say Green New Deal, they usually, I think, are more aligned or more apt to be supporting the Green New Deal as proposed by the Green Party. What, what's your take on that? Uh, where does the Green New Deal not go far enough? Uh, where is it? Where are its shortcomings? Where does that lie? And like, what does that tell us potentially about maybe the even the progressive wing of the Democratic Party as it stands? So I think that's a I think that is a great point. Um, one of the things that I have actually come across uh, in the last couple of months is a response to the Green New Deal that I think really broadens the approach and really strengthens the argument for the Green New Deal. And it is uh, called the Red Deal. And it is written um, by the Red Nation, which is an indigenous uh, climate activist group, right? Um, so the Red Deal is basically an expansion upon the Green New Deal that focuses on not only uh, environmentalism and not only moving towards more green infrastructure, which is something that the Green New Deal does cover. It expands upon that in, uh, in a way that uplifts more of the marginalized communities um, because the Green New Deal is a very short piece of legislation. You can read through the Green New Deal, it's very short. Um, the Red Deal is basically, uh, it's basically like an eco-socialist, I think the way that I like to, uh, you know, the way that I like to describe it is a eco-socialist manifesto, the way that they write it is it's a, it's a book on eco-socialism by indigenous activists, indigenous water preserve, uh, water keepers, um, for all types of eco-socialists, all types of environmental water protectors, all, all types of people who are concerned in, with the environment and who think environmental, uh, environmentally forward and first, right? Um, so the, the, the Green New Deal, great piece of legislation, but the Red Deal uh, does a great job at really flushing out uh, where decolonization and imperialism um, you know, it, it, the destruction of imperialism and, and decolonization and, and those types of things really do have to be part of the approach to environmentalism, right? Uh, like you said, the global south very much so uh, is, is a massive uh, victim of uh, industrialization and, and, and capitalism and uh, the resources that have been stripped from the global south. Uh, not only are those resources uh, something that uh, the, the stripping of those resources is what is contributing to the destruction of the planet, um, but also like those resources are being stripped, not just by people like they're being, uh, there's a lot of, uh, I'm trying to figure out how I want to say this, there is a lot of, uh, like I said, there's a lot of labor exploitation that goes into that, right? You see it with like lithium, far, like lithium mines and like the destruction of the rainforest, those things are happening because well, those things are happening at the behest of people who are being exploited by the, the global north. Um, so what the Green New Deal kind of fails to do is kind of see it as a global kind of struggle and see it as, a, uh, as something that needs to be, we need to address 
all aspects of. We need to address uh, the indigenous perspective more, right? The Green New Deal, uh, one of the biggest critiques I see of it is it doesn't really address an indigenous perspective on environmentalism and environmental action as much as it should. So that's what the Red Deal is. The Red Deal is officially, it's an endorsed kind of uh, platform and expansion by the Democratic Socialists of America. Um, it's like 150 pages. I would recommend picking it up. Uh, it's like $15 if you want to pick it up. Uh, it's a great expansion upon that where it does talk about things like the decolonization of the atmosphere. Basically the idea that the global north, uh, the carbon emissions that the global north takes up is making it impossible for the, any, uh, any nation in the global south to uh, you know, be able to be uplifted, right? Um, I think that uh, another kind of good expansion upon that, I would say, is if you ever check out the platform of the Howie Hawkins presidential campaign, the Green Party's Eco-Socialist Green New Deal talks about how a complete restructuring, uh, they, they call it a reconstruction of the economy, right? Instead of doing what the Green New Deal uh, the version in Congress would do, which is just kind of re-tinker how we do things and how we address things. The eco-socialist Green New Deal, the one championed by the Green Party, is a complete overhaul and a complete reconstruction of our economy to kind of drive it in a position where we are not really working towards, you know, the same capitalist goals of profit margin and stuff. Uh, whereas in the, you know, the eco-socialist Green New Deal, we're talking about, you know, they talk about a complete... Uh, nationalization of big oil and gas with the uh, with the uh, ultimate goal of phasing those out, right? Uh, and eventually once those are phased out, you move towards all green renewable energy. Um, we're talking about, uh, it also includes an economic environmental bill of rights that talks about uh, universal rent control and public housing as a human right, right? These are things that are starting to be addressed now. We see it as uh, these, are, these are platforms that are slowly being added onto the Green New Deal. Uh, the problem we see a lot is, you know, America, where we are at in our political sphere, you know, Marjorie Taylor Greene gets to shoot a piece of cardboard that says the Green New Deal and gets elected, right? Uh, the Green New Deal is seen by a lot of the American right as a gateway to socialism, which, you know, that's neither here nor there. I don't know. Um, I don't know if that's so true, but I do know that a lot of the critiques coming from the right aren't really based in a lot of uh, <laughs> are really based in a lot of facts. But the critiques from the left are basically like, yeah, we need a it needs to be a complete overhaul of our economic strategy. We can't we can't leave out indigenous uh, rights. We can't leave out uh, you know marginalized people as much. We can't begin to address the climate change the climate problem without addressing capital and capital's role in the climate issue, right? So that's basically where I come from in my critique of it. And that's where a lot of uh, leftists and eco-socialists kind of come from in their critique of the current Green New Deal that's kind of running around in Congress right now. Okay, wow. Um, I mean, that was amazing. <laughs> I, I, I appreciate the explanation. Um, you know, in, in being, I guess, respectful of your time, because I know you have work uh, coming up soon, what are some other books that you might suggest or other resources outside of the ones already noted that might give a better idea of environmentalism or might give a better idea of like eco-socialism should one want to learn more about it? Okay, so there is a book just called Eco-Socialism. It is, it's as a, it offers as a great uh, kind of introduction to eco-socialism as an idea. Um, I'm a firm believer that uh, environmentalist books as well, ones that, uh, Obviously, as long as they're not kind of based in uh, green capital, serve as a great uh, kind of tool for uh, in, uh, kind of training your environmentalism and, and becoming a better environmentalist. Um, one of the books that was incredibly influential to me was The Water Will Come um, by Jeff Goodell. Jeff Goodell, not really an eco-socialist, but the book doesn't really have much of a political tinge to it. It's basically just a book talking about the rising of the sea levels and how that will kind of affect us in a way that we really don't think about, right? We don't think about, um, we really don't think about, sorry, we really don't think about how uh, rising sea levels is going to affect immigration, it's going to affect people fleeing from the coast, right? We don't think about how rising sea levels worldwide is going to affect people immigrating um, between countries. Uh, another thing that the Red Deal talks about, right, is how you, if we're going to address the environmental problem, it is up to the 
uh, global north to have an open borders policy because it is ultimately the global north's um, you know, stripping of the resources uh, and, and destruction of the planet that are going to cause people to flee the, that destruction, right? And where are they going to go? They're going to go to the more privileged areas, the global north that isn't being affected as much, right? Um, so there's a lot of, that's, that's a great resource. Um, Silent Spring, great book, classic, you know, kind of birthed the environmental movement. There's a lot of really great resources out there for environmentalists. I just recommend uh, doing your own research and kind of figuring out which ones work best for you because there's books that are more kind of geared towards an eco-socialist tint. And there's more that are, that are kind of not, I don't want to say apolitical because environmentalism is not apolitical, but books that are just basically about here's what's happening to the planet and here's what we have to do to fix it, right? No, and I mean all of those are absolutely amazing. I, I I can't tell you how much I appreciate the perspective and the and the the, the resources. Uh, you know that being said, thank you again so much for coming on. It's now Josh's second time, I believe, on the pod. Uh, hopefully, won't be the last. Uh, it, for anyone who might be more interested uh, in in Josh, particularly in his activism, you can find him on Twitter at Josh underscore Willis six and on TikTok at Steez the Means. Uh, anyway. Thank you again, Josh, and I hope everyone has an absolutely wonderful day.